So good morning. We're continuing our journey through the book of Colossians. This is week, week 10. We've only got a few weeks left. That's the, maybe the good news depends on your point of view. The good news is we're, we're, we're kind of back on track. I've got a set number of verses I have to cover every week, and I've, I've kind of managed to claw back some of that time. So if you remember last week, we talked about, um, we were kind of ending chapter 2, and we were getting into chapter 3, and we talked about the dangers of teaching with false humility and the application in our church today around hubris and being, being wary of that. I also gave a little bit of background on why some folks thought angel worship was even a concept that they had to worry about. And then we began to talk through you know, Paul's attack on all of the legalistic rules that, and, the, and the, the heretical teachings that were beginning to infiltrate the church in Colossae. And how, you know, he reminded all the believers that, you know, we died with Christ to all of those rules and rights and religious practices. With that, we moved into the beginning of chapter 3. And the discussion was mostly around the principle that, you know, we, we died with Christ to the old rules. We now have been raised with Christ. And what that means to set our hearts and our minds on those things above and to be heavenly minded, and I kind of offered that as a one-line guidebook to, to Christian living. And towards the end of the class, we got into the verses around being hidden with Christ and how that gives us the power and enables us, right? That's, the, that's the, the power we have to be able to set our minds on things above, and that enables us to set our hearts on things above. It's that being hidden in Christ, that union with Christ that gives us access to that power to, to do that. And I, it's so beautiful because, you know, the, the command to set your mind on things above and set your heart on things above, it's both the command and the solution for being heavenly minded. So I think, it, I think it's just a beautiful, beautiful set of scripture. And what we're seeing so far in this journey through Colossians, especially the last, you know, half chapter or so, it's a really elegant discussion, a really elegant treatise that Paul is laying out for the church on the why and the how of, of Christian living. And that continues for most of the remaining portions of this letter as we, as we go through. So you see a couple of transition points. You know, Paul is taking everyone on a journey and he's moving very firmly now into that Christian living aspect. So with that as the background, let's dive back into to chapter 3. So put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. So again, if you think about kind of the flow and context of the, the letter up to this point, Paul has been talking about the lofty attitudes, the heavenly mindset we need to have around hiding in Christ, how we need to set our hearts and minds on our things above. And then verses 5 to 8 come right on the tail end of that, and they begin to describe in more detail the things that we should leave behind when we put off the old self. So there's an intention, I think there's a deliberate flow in how this letter is, is written. And I think that's a lot of the power of this verse and, the, and the, just the visual contrast that Paul is drawing through kind of that flow of how we have been raised with Christ, the things that we're dead to. And now because of this new state and the assurance of salvation that we have in this new state, there are some expectations, there are some behaviors and attitudes that we have to leave behind as part of dying to the old self. And in verse 5, you know, there's a therefore. Right, this is something I learned from Marty Miller. Whenever you're reading scripture and there's a therefore, pause because a big deal just happened. Right? There's, there's a, a, a conclusion to an argument coming up. And so we have a therefore here in, in verse 5. And what Paul is saying is this, is it, this should be a logical outcome. If we set our minds and we set our hearts on things above, therefore we should put these things to death. And there's a great parallel here to Romans 6, verse 13, which says, Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death 
to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. So again, you see that same concept of being dead to the old self and living a life of discipleship or striving for righteous, righteousness. And in verse 5, what Paul's arguing here, I think, is that the things that we need to put to death, it should be a natural result of living a Christian life. It's an intentional, deliberate putting these things to death if you are intentional and deliberate about setting your hearts on things above, setting your minds on things above, and bearing fruit, as we talked about earlier in, in the letter. Because if you have your hearts and minds set on things above, if you have a heavenly mindset, then those things that he lists in these group of verses, those should be shunned. They should not be a natural part of Christian living. So I think he's kind of making a logical argument that, you know, you're dead to these things, you've been made alive this way, this is how you're supposed to set your mind and your heart. Therefore, these are the things that will die as a result of that. And I think it's really interesting to note the sins that he lists here. And he kind of lists them in... in uh, I guess it's awkward to say, but kind of decreasing specificity. He starts really, really, really specific, and he kind of gets more broad. So he's, he's kind of covering all of his bases. And we're going to go through, you know, kind of an interpretation of what some of these sins are. And some of you may use different words. You may have different translations. Let's not get too distracted by that. I mean, we could, we could go down a rabbit hole for all five of these things. The point is to look at that list as a whole. And when taken as a whole, I think the meaning is really clear that we are to be heavenly minded and we are to strive for righteous living. So just as we need to be heavenly minded, the, the sins listed come from being earthly minded. And they can manifest in, in lots of ways. So he talks about sexual immorality. And this is a sin that you take into your body. And he's, I think he's talking about promiscuity. But... The, the language that's used tends to, tends to be a really specific case of selling off that sexual purity, that surrendering or selling off the sexual purity. And I, I think that Paul lists sexual immorality first because I would argue it's probably one of the most consistently powerful sins in human society. It's, I think it probably has been throughout most time and we certainly see that, see that today. So I think he's I think he's starting with, with uh, you can't really measure sin, I think he's starting with the most powerful and uh, the most temptation, uh, temptuous of the sins. He then talks about impurity, and think of this like uncleanliness, kind of, a, and if you compare the ritual uncleanliness that a lot of the members of the church would have thought about in that Old Testament context or the, the Old Covenant context, under the New Covenant, this is, this is impurity kind of in a moral sense. So instead of a physical state needing external cleansing, it's kind of an impurity brought about by lustful or overly luxurious and licentious living. So kind of hopefully you, you get that sense. Maybe think about it kind of like, you know, you've just showered or bathed and then you put on a grungy, sweaty, greasy, nasty sweater, right? That's kind of what he's talking about, that you've been made pure in this way. So why would you put on that nasty sweater or put on any aspects of the old life or the old self. That's kind of a sense here that he's, he's going around with moral uncleanliness. He then goes to lust. This is sensual passion. Um, it's a passion that's built on what is... It's a passion for what is forbidden built on really strong feelings. So it's not just a fleeting, flashing, I never thought of it before. This is kind of a building up of passionate feelings about something and it comes from setting your hearts or keeping your heart set on things that are below, right? You remember the command to set them on things above. Well, the opposite can lead you into this kind of sensual passion, lustful type state. When he talks about evil desires, this is an inwardly foul... Yeah. So I cheated. So the question was, hey, what version are you using? Because my, my translation is really generic. So I normally use the NIV, but I also cheated and went to the original language and tried to look at, okay, when you, you, know, when you use different versions of words, is there a context there? Um, so evil desires, this is kind of an inward foulness. 
It's an inner malice that's kind of flowing out of a morally rotten character. And it's, it's kind of a mode of thinking or feeling or acting. You know, think of it as just base wrongness or wickedness of, of persons. Then there's greed or covetousness. And, and this is, it's kind of an action word here. It's like a grasping greed, a grasping covetousness um, grown out of a selfishness. It, it's a selfishness that has grown to a passion that's now driving action, kind of this grasping, reaching kind of, kind of greed. I think if you think of it as avarice, greed, I think that's, that's close enough. But it's a lusting after a great number of, of earthly, and this is important for us, temporary things, things that will rot and fall away, but it's still an avarice for those, those temporary things. And then he says, which is idolatry, which is, you know, obviously it's the worship of, of false gods. Now let me, let me pause here for a question just to, to kind of test. How does God feel about idols? Is there any lack of clarity in the Bible about how God feels about idols? He is a jealous God. Other comments? Yeah, the, the comment is, is if when you think about the, the list of kings, a, a lot of the measure was whether they put up more idols or tore them, tore them down, right? Yeah. I don't know, think about the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt have how many other gods before me? No other gods before me. I think this is one of the consistent themes throughout the scriptures that God says, hey, look, I'm it. I am your God. I am the only God. Um... And so, you know, anything in our life that can become an idol, I think, becomes a real problem for us. And I think that's what Paul is reminding us here, is that the pursuit of a lot of these things can become an idol. An idol doesn't have to be a statue. An idol can be anything you put before God. For those of you who have heard me talk before, this is the, this is the time I usually hold up a phone as a representation of digital media, social media, digital temptation, whatever it is. And say, you know, this, in, in modern society, this has become an idol for a lot of us. And that's a great discussion point, right? If you're looking, if, if you're talking with your children, your grandchildren, your relatives, your coworkers, your neighbors, or whatever, be on the lookout. That can be, that can be an opening point to talk about the wonder of grace and the miracle of God and, and the all-sufficiency of Christ. Is that, you know, we don't, we don't need all, all of this and don't let that become an idol. Verse 6 and 7, I, I think this explains the consequence of the things that Paul has just told them about in verse, in verse 5. And the word wrath here, when, when I looked that up, just that one word is enough, at least to me, to make the point. Because there's a fascinating nuance here, right? Number one, if it says, if you do this and you get God's wrath, that should be enough. That should be like, okay, that's a, that's a big deal, I need to pay attention. But there's a fascinating nuance to that word here. It comes, from, it comes from the original word orge, which means an anger that's building up or an anger that has been welling up. And it comes from a verb that means to kind of swell. Think of like a huge wave swelling. Attach anger and wrath to that. And that's what Paul is describing. So it's not, a, not an instant or a rash anger. It's something that is, number one, very powerful, very long in duration, very big, and, and permanent. So it's referring to God's kind of fixed, controlled, passionate objection to sin. And one, one study source quoted this as a, a settled or a resolved indignation. So anyway, I just, I think it's, you know, words mean things and I like to, I like to go find out, you know, what the context is. But again, even if you just took wrath in its simplest definition, that sh to me that should be enough for, for the message. And in verse 7, he talks about, or he, he says, you used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. And I think, I think the way he described it and the words he used, I think it's very deliberate. Because, you know, walk in these ways, he's talking about walking in the old self. And, you know, these were the sins that were part of our, our breath. It was the air we breathed. It was the native element, right? When we're walking in the old self, we're walking in this total immersion, total environment of, of sin 
or absent of God. You, you can define those things the same way. It's your mind's focus, it's your heart's desire, and all of those things are separated from God. And that's what Paul is meaning when he says, walking in your, walk in these ways or walking in the old life. And if you're, I think in verse 6 and 7, what Paul's saying here is that you are going to be destroyed in your old life. Or maybe you were destroyed in your old life. When we were dead to sin, I think, you know, this is what I would call a life and death statement. You were in a state, you were completely separated from God, you had no hope. That was your old life. And I think Paul is just reminding them, because of that, he can now contrast how much more wonderful it is to be made alive in Christ and the union we have when we are hidden in Christ that we talked about earlier. And I think Paul, again, intentionally, he's going for a very visual and visceral contrast. He, he, I think he does a great job making his arguments through these really powerful um, contrasts. And, and, you know, you were dead and you were made alive. And I think verses 5, 6, 7 continue that kind of contrast to, to make a point. Because if you were living in the old self, you were dead or you will die to sin... And I think of this kind of as a, you're just wallowing around. I say you, we, them, us. All, of, all, all folks who are not believers or, or folks before we became believers. It's kind of wallowing around in this environment of sin and separation from God. And then you contrast that with this peaceful, powerful, beautiful, being hidden with Christ, this union. And I think, I think again, that contrast is really, really powerful. And it kind of makes me think of the story of the prodigal son. You know, I, I think you could describe that maybe as, you know, when he's literally wallowing around with the pigs, digging for husks to eat. That's kind of the old self. And then when he returns home, he, he's contrite, he's humble, he's thankful, and then he gets to sit at the feast table and sleep in a comfortable bed and have the finest robes and and rings, but it's very much with a spirit of humility and humble thankfulness. Anyway, that's kind of what I think about when I see the contrast that Paul, Paul is making here. In verse 8, he continues on and he says, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. When he says, but now... I think that's a reminder that we are no longer to live in those things. Those things being the sins and the consequences of verses 6 and 7. So he's kind of listed out those sins and that, that old self-state. And he's saying, but now you can't live in those. You can't live in those things anymore. And there's some other stuff you have to put to death. There's some other things you have to, I think, deliberately consistently and consciously steer away from. And so he gives another list. One is anger. I think of this kind of as a character trait. It's the same word as wrath that was used in the, in the previous verse, in verse 6. So that's why I kind of think of this as a character trait. It's not a sudden outburst or emotion. And, and some of us may have come across those people that just, they seem to always be angry or they, just, they have some deep unresolved anger and it just tends to come through in all of their words and, and, and behavior. When he talks about rage, this is a boiling up or a bursting out of, of anger. It is a sudden outburst. Malice, I think here, is it's a wicked disposition. And slander, it's speech that's harmful to another's name. But what's interesting about that word, the more general form literally means someone that is slow or sluggish to call something good when it's really good, and they're slow or they're sluggish to call something bad, even though it really is clearly evil, it's almost a switching of, of good and evil. So it's it kind of a sense of exchanging the truth of God for a lie. And again, if you think about the context of the, you know, the philosophies that they were battling against, the mysticism, the Gnosticism, I think, again, this is a really subtle but really powerful kind of gig at that, that whole type of, type of thinking. He's, he's kind of saying, look, your, your enlightened thinking isn't actually enlightened. It's just dead wrong. 
And if you persist in it, ye will be dead in sin. And I think that's another one of these, these this, it's like a timeless God laser that just goes straight through time and immediately applies or still applies here in America today in a Western, um, Western society. I think we see a lot of this enlightened thinking. We see a lot of evil masked as enlightened thinking. And it kind of goes back to the discussion we had a few weeks ago about hollow and deceptive philosophy. You know, I can take almost any sin and using hollow and deceptive philosophy and make it sound like it's something that's okay. Right? One of the greatest tools of the adversary. We saw that in the church in Colossae. You saw it in the Old Testament. We still see it in America today. Filthy language, he describes. It's, it's low and shameful speech. I think it, it literally is filthy language. What's interesting about this list, it, it's less about the specifics of the, the words. It's more when you look at the, the list kind of in its totality, think about how many of these things come out of the heart. And clearly, things that would come out of a heart that is not set on things above. And if you've been paying attention, I think you'll see how Paul, he kind of actually groups these things together in comparison. You know, there are five of them in verse 6, there are five of them in verse 8. I don't know that there's a, an obvious spiritual significance there, but it adds just a crispness to, to, this le- to the structure of the letter, to the approach that Paul took, to the comprehensiveness of, of the argument. And I think the church at Colossae would need that because if one of the influences is kind of this Greek philosophical questioning everything and he with the best question that upsets the entire argument kind of wins, Paul has to have an ironclad total structure to really defeat every possible line of thinking. So you, you continue to see that structure. It's, it's actually a masterfully written letter when you think about it also from that, that perspective. So, so the comment was around a view that, that the first list is kind of how I treat myself and the second list is kind of how I treat God and how those things together wrap up into, uh, I'm going to translate your, your, or translate your comment a little bit. Yeah, the second list, sorry, one's how I treat myself, the second list, how I treat other people and how those two things together embody, embody Christian living. living. I, and I, I think that that's, that's a valid point. What Paul's really driving at here, I think, is he's, he's mostly contrasting. If you remember last week, we talked about since then, set your minds on things above, and he gives some justification, set your hearts on things above. In these verses, he's now contrasting what happens if you don't set your mind and hearts on things above, both on how you treat yourself, how you treat others, and those things affect how you treat God as well. So the comment was, was a view on how it can be tempting to feel like the first list is the important one and the second one, and eh, it's less important, and you know, maybe I can let myself get away with it or, or whatever. And I, I think it leads us to a, a conversation that you know, there is no weight in sin. It's either sin or it's not. And trying to rank them is a very human concept. 
I think it's tied to really more of our sense of justice and our criminal, our, our penal code, right, where you do have a, you do have measures of wrongness, and that measure doesn't apply. I mean, you're you're in a state of sin, or you're or you're not. I think what Paul's trying to do here with these verses and the contrast and, and you know the, the lists, he's he's reminding the church and that includes us that if our hearts are full of Christ and if we're living through and by the Holy Spirit, then there shouldn't be room for these things. These are signposts to kind of help warn us when we've when we've gone off the narrow path. That if we're living by the Spirit, none of these things should normally be present in our thoughts, words, and deeds. And I say normally present, and that's an autobiographical comment, because guess what? I'm not perfect, and I do struggle with some of these things. And this is a reminder that, look, it's a journey. Every day, we ha- I, have to, I have to take captive every thought, like we're told in 2 Corinthians 10.5. Every day, I have to take captive every thought and make you obedient to Christ. And I think that's part of what Paul is, is reminding us, too, is that we do... Part of that setting our minds and hearts on things above, it is a daily, it's not a one and done. You don't just do it one time, right? It's a, it's a bearing fruit, being a disciple, it's a, it's a daily journey. I think these lists together are just a reminder of the types of things we're supposed to leave, leave, leave behind as we do that. Okay, moving on, verses 9 through 11. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. When he says, do not lie, you know, I kind of hope this was maybe directed at new converts that were still trying to figure out what the whole Christianity thing was. Um, I hope it wasn't, I hope, I hope the mature brethren in the church didn't need this reminder, but, you know, we don't know. Regardless, the important point that he's making is that truthfulness is connected to being that new creation, that nothing untruthful, nothing untruthful can be holy. I think that's the, the takeaway. And when he talks about the new self, in the Greek here, it means the recently put on self. But it is past tense. It's past tense, but something that recently happened. And then being renewed, it's a present tense with a kind of a continuous nature. So being renewed, it's that daily walk. It's that daily prayer, that daily discipleship, the daily scripture reading, right? So again, the the verb tense, I think, is really powerful there. And it's being renewed in knowledge. And, And he's not talking about knowledge of everything. He's talking about knowledge of God. And if you remember, there was a whole section earlier in the letter talking about obtaining godly knowledge and what the benefits are. So he's kind of connecting this back to that thought earlier in the earlier in the letter that as we walk in his ways, as we obey his precepts, we grow in him and that's part of our ability to produce the spiritual fruit. And it's that daily union as we're hidden with Christ, the what the message here is is that daily union that regenerates us and it brings us into that intimacy with Christ and gives us that insight into his will for our lives. So there, there's, a, there's a lot in just those couple of phrases. And I gave you some references if you want to make note. You can, if, if you want more about kind of that daily union and intimacy. And he talks about the image of the creator. The idea here is that man's, you know, when we are renewed in Christ, we are, Christ makes us what the creator at first designed us to be, which is something in his, in his own image but now it's that image of, of Christ. Verse 11, I know I'm going through this really fast. Again, I'm trying to get to verse 14, and I have a hard time deadline today, so at 944, I'm walking out today. I'm sorry. Um, 
so if I ignore your questions, it's not because I'm, I'm being mean. I'm, I have a family commitment that I'm going to get in big trouble if I miss. So anyway. Verse 11, though, is a bombshell verse. And it's not so much a bombshell spiritually as it would be culturally, and I'll explain that in a minute. But I think this is part of why Paul was such a troublemaker, especially the Jewish religious caste at the time. This verse and all of the thinking that goes around it would have been incredibly upsetting to that culture, to prejudices at the time, to social structure and norms and, and, and whatnot. And it's really easy to miss. It's really easy to miss, I think. But when he says, here there is neither, more literally it, it means there exists neither. And, it, and it, it's, it's not just a statement of fact. It's a statement that even the possibility of those differences existing in believers is not possible. So he is really throwing down a very firm argument here. When he says Greek nor Jew, he's referring to national origin. So national origins have no consequence in the church. There's no value. There's no relative value on where you were born. Circumcision or not, we talked about that in a, in a, previous, a previous week, but it's about the old rules and from the old law. Those have no spiritual value. So former Jews that were converted, they weren't given any preferential treatment under the gospel. It was, you know, it was kind, of, kind of goes back to that fairness piece that we talked about early on in the, in the quarter. Barbarian and Scythian, I know a few barbarians, I don't know any Scythians. Um, the bar barbarian was simply to mean the foreigner, and you can compare that to 1 Corinthians 14, 11, but it really means someone outside of Colossae or someone outside of, you know, it would be a, a foreigner. So I think we can get our head around that. But Scythian was, was like a more savage form of a foreigner. And the Scythians at the time, this is the, this is the only time it's used in the New Testament. That's also another really interesting, you know, when you're studying and you see a word that's only used one time, I always like to kind of lean in and try to figure out what that is. But it refers to people that live in the north and northeast around the Black and the Caspian Seas. It's, it's now, you know, we would call them Mongols or, or Tartars, T-A-R-T-A-R. -T -A -R. That name was almost synonymous with the concept of a barbarian or, or a savage, but the Scythians were regarded as particularly wild and savage. And the reason that's important is because if even such a ferocious and uncivilized people were not excluded from the gospel, they were welcome, just as welcome as any other person from any other civilization. They were entitled to the same privileges as others. That would have been a real shock to the culture at, at the time. No one was excluded, even if they belonged to the rudest, most uncivilized portion of mankind. So including the savages... It's a rebuke of pride and intellect. It's a direct attack on kind of that, the contempt of the unlearned, this kind of intellectual elitism. Again, another lesson that we see, I mean, it's like he pulled this out of the headline from yesterday. But it's kind of an attack on this intellectual elitism, which lay at the root of Gnosticism that we've, we've talked about a few times today. And this one is particularly tough for me because an Aggie, as an Aggie, I have to admit that, yes, Longhorns and LSU Cajuns will also be in heaven. That's a really, I've really wrestled with this, with this verse. But when he talks about slave or free, it's important that the condition of being a free man or not doesn't give him any special claims or advantages in regards to eternal value and access to salvation. The condition of being a slave does not exclude that person from the hope of heaven or from being regarded as a child of God. In fact, they were all on the same terms and entitled to the same privileges as their master. Again, that would have been very upsetting to that culture, that they're very disruptive. And what Paul is doing here in this verse is he's canceling the most radical differences of nationality, ceremonial status, culture, social position, and in regards to the, the ability to be saved and the heavenly value, he's saying none of that matters because Christ died for all. And that's literal. He died for all. None are superior, therefore none can be inferior in the eyes of Christ and in our eternal value. And it kind of goes to what I call the epic fairness of the gospel. And we talked about that, I think, maybe in week one, 
how the gospel is open to everybody. And that's what Paul is saying here. Is that when he says everybody, he means, I don't care where you're born, what color your skin is, what accent you have, whether you've you know, had certain religious rights or not, Christ died for all. And he, is, he died for all things, and Christ is in all things. So Christ is our center, is the point he's making, and that from that center comes our eternal value. That's the bombshell. Our eternal value has nothing to do with what we look like or where we were born. Our eternal value exclusively comes from Christ. And that Christ's glory shines equally through all, through all of us, regardless of you know, facts of race or history or status. They were overruled in their eternal value. He's like, none of that matters in heaven. None of that matters when you're in, in Christ. And I think, again, if you, if you consider the language that Paul used when he says, if we are hidden in Christ, you can't see or hear anyone else's outward differences. And that would have been a bombshell because it's a radical contradiction to some of the deepest prejudices, some of the classical paganism and kind of that distorted Judaism at, at the time. And it's, it's a wonderful revelation and I think this idea sets up what we're going to talk about next week around the structure of submission. Because if we, are all, if we all have equal value in Christ, then the structure of submission, those are, those are reflections of our individual roles, not a reflection of our individual worth. It's not a seriatim of value. I'm not submitting to someone that's more important. I'm submitting as a matter of organizational structure because we all have the same the same value in Christ. So it's not a ranking. So I think Paul is firing the first shot across the bow of what he covers in the next verses around submission. But we need to be careful with this scripture too because it can get misused. While clearly there is acceptance, there's only acceptance when it comes to the openness of the gospel in terms of outward appearance, origins, and whatnot. This is not an acceptance of lifestyles. This is not an acceptance of sin or unholiness or untruthfulness, right? These are acceptance of physical characteristics, not of sin. So if you hear folks talking about the acceptance of all, they're right as long as that's not a justification for sin because that would be a direct contradiction to Scripture. So again, powerful, powerful verse that can get misused when pulled, pulled out of context. I'm going to try to get through these last verses in six minutes, and I don't think I'm going to. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. I can just kind of hear a, ah, spiritually, when you get to, you know, after we've been through all this anger and malice and, and unholiness, and now we get to this holy and dearly loved people, clothing ourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you have a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them together in perfect unity. There's another therefore, and again, earlier on, I think it once we heard the risk of that boiling up of God's wrath versus the joy of being hidden in Christ and rising with him in glory, I think you'd have to be pretty thick not to embrace this conclusion, but apparently... As humans, we are all pretty thick, and we need that reminder. As chosen people, there are lots of, lots of examples. I gave you a few other references here. You can look that up if you want. Um, for holy and dearly loved, so as the elected, we are holy and consecrated to God in thought and in life. And as beloved, we are accepted and sustained by that consecration of, of Christ's love. Therefore, we should clothe ourselves with that love, you know, we, we have taken off the old self, we've, we've shed the old life, we've shed the old attitudes and desires, we've put on the new self, we read about that in verse 9. But our call for discipleship is to make this ideal real in practice by an ongoing daily obedient faith. And if you'll note, we talked about a little bit, you know, in the structure here, Paul uses five characteristics to balance the five sins of the mind and sins of the heart from earlier in the chapter. Maybe coincidence, but look, I still appreciate the balance. I think it's just you know, part of the art of the letter as well as the incredible spiritual 
significance. In verse 13... Uh, you know, the pardon received from Christ, that binds us to forgive others, right? We now have, the, we now have a, a peace and a power of forgiveness. And in Matthew 18, 33, we're reminded, shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? So again, lots of, lots of scriptural support for this concept, but the key message is, look, you've been forgiven, therefore you also, as clothing yourself in love, also have to be able to forgive others. And we could talk a whole week just on that one phrase, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep moving. When he talks about bearing with one another, there's a great parallel in Ephesians 4, 2, when it says, be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. And so he's drawing on that same concept of being united with Christ, if we're hidden in him, then love must be the result. And we see that in, in verse 14 here in just a minute. Because as Christ forgave you, Paul compl- he totally flexes on the Colossians here. Because remember, Christ, what happened to him? He was denigrated, beaten, he was crucified. Probably the most painful way to die ever invented by man. And he forgave us. So what Paul is doing, he's taking away any excuse we might have to not forgive someone else. No one else has suffered more than Christ. And if he can forgive us, we have no excuse. Forgiveness is part of that, part of that love. And there's kind of a cool ling- linguistic facet here that the pronouns that are used, it's a reflexive pronoun. That means it kind of has a relationship and it implies a oneness in the unity of the church. It literally means that as we're forgiving others, it's kind of like we're also forgiving So a really powerful concept there. And in verse 14, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them together in perfect unity. Love is what bonds all this together. And he's extending the metaphor of that that clothing. We're putting off the old self. We're putting on the outer garment of of love because love is supreme. And it's this outer garment, which is the bond that holds our Christian character together within the concept of the church of Christ here on, here on earth. It's the final outer garment that, bonds, that binds all these things together. And some would call it the bond of unity. And with that, I will wish you peace and grace from God our Father. Um, I will not be here next week. I have a more than qualified substitute, and I uh, hope to see you all in a couple of weeks. Thank you.